The Piazza by Herman Melville. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. With fairest flowers, whilst summer lasts, and I live here, Fidel. When I removed into the country, it was to occupy an old-fashioned farmhouse, which had no piazza, a deficiency the more regretted, because not only did I like piazzas, as somehow combining the coziness of indoors with the freedom of outdoors, and it is so pleasant to inspect your thermometer there, but the country round about was such a picture, that in very time no boy climbs hill or crosses vale without coming upon easels planted in every nook and sunburnt painters painting there, a very paradise of painters, the circle of the stars cut by the circle of the mountains. At least so looks it from the house, though once upon the mountains no circle of them can you see. Had the site been chosen five rods off, this charmed ring would not have been. The house is old. Seventy years since, from the heart of the hearthstone hills, they quarried the Kaaba, or Holy Stone, to which, each Thanksgiving, the social pilgrims used to come. So long ago that in digging for the foundation the workmen used both spade and axe, fighting the troglodytes of those subterranean parts, sturdy roots of a sturdy wood, encamped upon what is now a long landslide of sleeping meadow, sloping away off from my poppy-bed. Of that knit wood, but one survivor stands, an elm, lonely through steadfastness. Whoever built the house, he builded better than he knew, or else Orion in the zenith flashed down his Damocles sword to him some starry night and said, Build there. For how otherwise could it have entered the builder's mind that, upon the clearing being made, such a purple prospect would be his? nothing less than Greylock, with all his hills about him, like Charlemagne among his peers. Now, for a house, so situated in such a country, to have no piazza for the convenience of those who might desire to feast upon the view, and take their time and ease about it, seemed as much of an omission as if a picture-gallery should have no bench. For what but picture-galleries are the marble halls of these same limestone hills? Galleries hung month after month anew with pictures ever fading into pictures ever fresh. And beauty is like piety. You cannot run and read it. Tranquility and constancy, with nowadays an easy chair, are needed. For though of old, when reverence was in vogue and indolence was not, the devotees of nature doubtless used to stand and adore just as in the cathedrals of those ages the worshippers of a higher power did. Yet, in these times of failing faith and feeble knees, we have the piazza and the pew. During the first year of my residence, the more leisurely to witness the coronation of Charlemagne, weather permitting they crown him every sunrise and sunset, I chose me, on the hillside bank nearby, a royal lounge of turf, a green velvet lounge with long moss-padded back, while at the head, strangely enough, there grew, but I suppose for heraldry, three tufts of blue violets in a field argent of wild strawberries, and a trellis with honeysuckle I set for canopy. Very majestical lounge indeed, so much so that here, as with the reclining majesty of Denmark in his orchard, a sly earache invaded me. But if damps abound at times in Westminster Abbey, because it is so old, why not within this monastery of mountains, which is older? A piazza must be had. The house was wide, my fortune narrow, so that to build a panoramic piazza, one round and round, it could not be, although, indeed, considering the matter by rule and square, the carpenters, in the kindest way, were anxious to gratify my furthest wishes, at I've forgotten how much a foot. 
upon but one of the four sides would prudence grant me what I wanted. Now, which side? To the east, that long camp of the Hearthstone Hills, fading far away towards Quito, and every fall a small white flake of something peering suddenly, of a coolish morning, from the topmost cliff, the season's new-dropped lamb, its earliest fleece, and then the Christmas dawn, draping those dim highlands with red-barred plaids and tartans. Goodly sight from your piazza, that. Goodly sight, but to the north is Charlemagne. Can't have the hearthstone hills with Charlemagne. Well, the south side. Apple trees are there. Pleasant, of a balmy morning in the month of May. To sit and see that orchard, white-budded as for a bridal. And in October, one green arsenal yard, such piles of ruddy shot. Very fine, I grant, but to the north is Charlemagne. The west side. Look, an upland pasture, alleying away into a maple wood at top. Sweet in opening spring, to trace upon the hillside, otherwise gray and bare. To trace, I say, the oldest paths by their streaks of earliest green. Sweet indeed, I can't deny. But to the north is Charlemagne. So Charlemagne, he carried it. It was not long after 1848, and somehow, about that time, all round the world, these kings, they had the casting vote, and voted for themselves. No sooner was ground broken than all the neighborhood, neighbor Dives in particular, broke too into a laugh. Piazza to the north, winter piazza. Once of winter midnights, to watch the aurora borealis, I suppose. Hope he's laid in good store of polar muffs and mittens. That was in the lion month of March. Not forgotten are the blue noses of the carpenters and how they scouted at the greenness of the chit, who would build his sole piazza to the north. But March don't last forever. Patience, and August comes. And then, in the cool Elysium of my northern bower, I, Lazarus, in Abraham's bosom, cast down the hill a pitying glance on poor old Dives, tormented in the purgatory of his piazza to the south. But even in December this northern piazza does not repel, nipping cold and gusty though it be, and the north wind, like any miller, bolting by the snow, in finest flower. For then, once more, with frosted beard, I pace the sleety deck, weathering Cape Horn. In summer, too, canute-like, sitting here, one is often reminded of the sea. For not only do long ground swells roll the slanting grain, and little wavelets of the grass ripple over upon the low piazza as their beach, and the blown down of dandelions is wafted like the spray, and the purple of the mountains is just the purple of the billows, and a still August noon broods upon the deep meadows as a calm upon the line. But the vastness and the lonesomeness are so oceanic, and the silence and the sameness too, that the first peep of a strange house rising beyond the trees is for all the world like spying on the Barbary coast an unknown sail. And this recalls my inland voyage to fairyland. A true voyage, but take it all in all, interesting as if invented. From the piazza, some uncertain object I had caught, mysteriously snugged away, to all appearance, in a sort of purpled breast pocket, high up in a hopper like hollow, or sunken angle among the northwestern mountains. Yet, whether really it was on a mountain side or a mountain top, could not be determined, because though viewed from favorable points, a blue summit, peering up away behind the rest, will, as it were, talk to you over their heads, and plainly tell you that, though he, the blue summit, seems among them, 
he is not of them, God forbid, and indeed would have you know that he considers himself, as to say truth he has good right, by several cubits their superior, nevertheless certain ranges here and there double-filed as in platoons, so shoulder and follow up upon one another, with their irregular shapes and heights, that from the piazza, a nigher and lower mountain will in most states of the atmosphere effacingly shade itself away into a higher and further one that an object bleak on the former's crest will for all that appear nested in the latter's flank these mountains somehow they play at hide-and-seek and all before one's eyes but be that as it may the spot in question was at all events so situated as to be only visible and then but vaguely under certain witching conditions of light and shadow indeed for a year or more i knew not there was such a spot and might perhaps have never known had it not been for a wizard afternoon in autumn late in autumn a mad poet's afternoon when the turned maple woods in the broad basin below me having lost their first vermilion tint dully smoked like smouldering towns when flames expire upon their prey and rumour had it that this smokiness in the general air was not all indian summer which was not used to be so sick a thing however mild but in great part was blown from far-off forests for weeks on fire in vermont so that no wonder the sky was ominous as hecate's cauldron and two sportsmen crossing a red stubble buckwheat field seemed guilty macbeth and foreboding banquo and the hermit's son hutted in an adullam cave well towards the south according to his season did little else but by indirect reflection of narrow rays shot down a simplon pass among the clouds just steadily paint one small round strawberry mole upon the wan cheek of northwestern hills signal as a candle one spot of radiance where all else was shade fairies there thought i some haunted ring where fairies dance time passed and the following may after a gentle shower upon the mountains a little shower islanded in misty seas of sunshine such a distant shower and sometimes two and three and four of them all visible together in different parts as i loved to watch from the piazza instead of thunderstorms as i used to which wrap old greylock like a sinai till one thinks swart moses must be climbing among scathed hemlocks there after i say that gentle shower i saw a rainbow resting its further end just where in autumn i had marked the mole fairies there thought i remembering that rainbows bring out the blooms and that if one can but get to the rainbow's end his fortune is made in a bag of gold yon rainbow's end would i were there thought i and none the less i wished it for now first noticing what seemed some sort of glen or grotto in the mountain side at least whatever it was viewed through the rainbow's medium it glowed like the Potosi mine. But a workaday neighbor said, no doubt it was but some old barn, an abandoned one, its broadside beaten in, the acclivity its background. But I, though I had never been there, I knew better. A few days after, a cheery sunrise kindled a golden sparkle in the same spot as before. The sparkle was of that vividness it seemed as if it could only come from glass. The building, then, if building after all it was, could at least not be a barn, much less an abandoned one. Stale hay, ten years musting in it. No, if aught built by mortal, it must be a cottage, perhaps long vacant and dismantled, but this very spring magically fitted up and glazed. Again, one noon, in the same direction, I marked, over dimmed tops of terraced foliage, a broader gleam, as of a silver buckler held sunwards over some croucher's head, which gleam, experience in like cases taught, must come from a roof newly shingled. 
This, to me, made pretty sure the recent occupancy of that far cot in fairyland. Day after day now, full of interest in my discovery, what time I could spare from reading the Midsummer's Night Dream, and all about Titania, wishfully I gazed off towards the hills, but in vain. Either troops of shadows, an imperial guard with slow pace and solemn, defiled along the steeps, or, routed by pursuing light, fled broadcast from east to west, old wars of Lucifer and Michael. Or the mountains, though unvexed by these mirrored sham fights in the sky, had an atmosphere otherwise unfavorable for fairy views. I was sorry, the more so because I had to keep my chamber for some time after, which chamber did not face those hills. At length, when pretty well again, and sitting out in the September morning upon the piazza, and thinking to myself, when just after a little flock of sheep, the farmer's banded children passed, a nutting, and said how sweet a day it was, after all, but what their fathers call a weather-breeder, and indeed was become go-sensitive through my illness, as that I could not bear to look upon a Chinese creeper of my adoption, and which, to my delight, climbing a post of the piazza, had burst out in starry bloom. But now, if you remove the leaves a little, showed millions of strange cankerous worms, which, feeding upon those blossoms, so shared their blessed hue as to make it unblessed evermore, worms whose germs had doubtless lurked in the very bulb which, so hopefully, I had planted. In this ingrate peevishness of my weary convalescence was I sitting there when, suddenly, looking off, I saw the golden mountain window, dazzling like a deep-sea dolphin. Fairies there, thought I once more, the queen of fairies at her fairy window, at any rate some glad mountain girl. It will do me good, it will cure this weariness, to look on her. No more. I'll launch my yawl. Ho, cheerly, heart and push away for fairyland, for rainbow's end in fairyland. How to get to fairyland, by what road, I did not know, nor could anyone inform me, not even one Edmund Spencer, who had been there, so he wrote me, further than that to reach fairyland it must be voyaged to, and with faith. I took the fairy mountain's bearings, and the first fine day, when strength permitted, got into my yawl, high-pommeled leather one, cast off the fast, and away I sailed, free voyager as an autumn leaf. Early dawn, and sailing westward, I sowed the morning before me. Some miles brought me nigh the hills, but out of present sight of them. I was not lost for roadside golden rods as guideposts pointed I doubted not the way to the golden window. Following them I came to a lone and languid region where the grass-grown ways were travelled but by drowsy cattle that, less waked than stirred by day, seemed to walk in sleep. Browse they did not. The enchanted never eat. At least, so says Don Quixote, that sagest sage, that ever lived. On I went, and gained at last the fairy mountain's base, but saw yet no fairy ring. A pasture rose before me, letting down five mouldering bars, so moistly green they seemed fished up from some sunken wreck, a wigged old Ares, long-visaged and with crumpled horn, came snuffing up, and then, retreating decorously, led on along a milky way of white weed, past dim clustering Pleiades and Hyades, of small forget-me-nots, and would have led me further still his astral path, but for golden flights of yellow birds, pilots surely, to the golden window, to one side flying before me from bush to bush, towards deep woods, which woods themselves were luring, and somehow lured, too, by their fence, banning a dark road which, however dark, led up. I pushed through, when Ares, renouncing me now for some lost soul, 
wheeled and went his wiser way, forbidding and forbidden ground to him. A winter wood road matted all along with winter green. By the side of pebbly waters, waters the cheerier for their solitude, beneath swaying fir boughs petted by no season but still green and all, on I journeyed, my horse and I, on by an old sawmill bound down and hushed with vines that his grating voice no more was heard on by a deep flume clothed through snowy marble vernal tinted where freshet eddies had on each side spun out empty chapels in the living rock on where jacks in the pulpit like their baptist namesake preached but to the wilderness on where a huge cross-grain block fern-bedded showed where in forgotten times man after man had tried to split it but lost his wedges for his pains which wedges yet rusted in their holes on where ages passed in step-like ledges of a cascade skull hollow pots had been churned out by ceaseless whirling of a flintstone ever wearing but itself unworn on by wild rapids pouring into a secret pool but soothed by circling there a while issued forth serenely on to less broken ground and by a little ring where truly fairies must have danced or else some wheel tire been heated for all was bare still on and up and out into a hanging orchard where maidenly looked down upon me a crescent moon from morning my horse hitched low his head. Red apples rolled before him. Eve's apples. Seek no furthers. He tasted one, I another. It tasted of the ground. Fairyland not yet, thought I, flinging my bridle to a humped old tree that crooked out an arm to catch it. For the way now lay where path was none, and none might go but by himself, and only go by daring through blackberry brakes that tried to pluck me back, though I but strained towards fruitless growths of mountain laurel, up slippery steeps to barren heights where stood none to welcome. Fairyland not yet, thought I, though the morning is here before me. Footsore enough and weary, I gained not then my journey's end, but came ere long to a craggy pass dipping towards growing regions still beyond. A zigzag road, half overgrown with blueberry bushes, here turned among the cliffs. A rent was in their ragged sides. Through it a little track branched off, which, upwards threading that short defile, came breezily out above, to where the mountain top, part sheltered northward by a taller brother, sloped gently off a space, ere darkly plunging. And here, among fantastic rocks, reposing in a herd, the foot-track wound, half-beaten, up to a little low-storied grayish cottage, capped, nun-like, with a peaked roof. On one slope the roof was deeply weather-stained, and nigh the turfy eaves-trough, all velvet-napped. No doubt the snail-monks founded mossy priories there. The other slope was newly shingled. On the north side, doorless and windowless, the clapboards, innocent of paint, were yet green as the north side of lichened pines or copperless hulls of Japanese junks becalmed. The whole base, like those of the neighboring rocks, was rimmed about with shaded streaks of richest sod. For with hearthstones in fairyland, the natural rock, though housed, preserves to the last, just as in open fields, its fertilizing charm only by necessity working now at a remove to the sward without so at least says oberon grave authority in fairy lore though setting oberon aside certain it is that even in the common world the soil close up to farmhouses as close up to pasture rocks is even though untended ever richer than it is a few rods off such gentle nurturing heat is radiated there but with this cottage the shaded streaks were richest in its front and about its entrance, where the ground-sill, and especially the door-sill, had, 
through long eld quietly settled down no fence was seen no enclosure nearby ferns 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 further woods 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 beyond mountains 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 then sky 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 turned out in aerial commons pasture for the mountain moon nature and but nature house and all even a low cross pile of silver birch piled openly to season up among whose silvery sticks as through the fencing of some sequestered grave sprang vagrant raspberry bushes willful asserters of their right of way the foot track so dainty narrow just like a sheep track led through long ferns that lodged fairyland at last thought i una and her lamb dwell here truly a small abode mere palanquin set down on the summit in a pass between two worlds participant of neither a sultry hour and i wore a light hat of yellow sennet with white duck trousers both relics of my tropic sea-going clogged in the muffling ferns i softly stumbled staining the knees a sea-green pausing at the threshold or rather where threshold once had been i saw through the open doorway a lonely girl sewing at a lonely window a pale-cheeked girl and fly-specked window with wasps about the mended upper panes i spoke she shyly started like some tahiti girl secreted for a sacrifice first catching sight through palms of captain cook recovering she bade me enter with her apron brushed off a stool then silently resumed her own with thanks i took the stool but now for a space i too was mute this then is the fairy mountain house and here the fairy queen sitting at her fairy window i went up to it downwards directed by the tunneled pass as through a leveled telescope i caught sight of a far-off soft azure world i hardly knew it though i came from it you must find this view very pleasant said i at last oh sir tears starting in her eyes the first time i looked out of this window i said never never shall i weary of this and what wearies you of it now i don't know while a tear fell but it is not the view it is mariana some months back her brother only seventeen had come hither a long way from the other side to cut wood and burn coal and she elder sister had accompanied him long had they been orphans and now sole inhabitants of the sole house upon the mountain no guest came no traveller passed the zigzag perilous road was only used at seasons by the coal wagons the brother was absent the entire day sometimes the entire night when at evening fagged out he did come home he soon left his bench poor fellow for his bed just as one at last wearily quits that too for still deeper rest the bench the bed the grave silent i stood by the fairy window while these things were being told do you know said she at last as stealing from her story do you know who lives yonder i have never been down into that country away off there i mean that house that marble one pointing far across the lower landscape have you not caught it there on the long hillside the field before the woods behind the white shines out against their blue don't you mark it the only house in sight i looked and after a time to my surprise recognized more by its position than its aspect or mariana's description my own abode glimmering much like this mountain one from the piazza the mirage haze made it appear less a farmhouse than king charming's palace 
I have often wondered who lives there, but it must be some happy one. Again, this morning I was thinking so. Some happy one? I returned, starting. And why do you think that? You judge some rich one lives there? Rich or not, I never thought. But it looks so happy I can't tell how, and it is so far away. Sometimes I think I do but dream it is there. You should see it in a sunset. No doubt the sunset gilds it finely, but not more than the sunrise does this house, perhaps. This house? The sun is a good sun, but it never gilds this house. Why should it? This old house is rotting. That makes it so mossy. In the morning the sun comes in at this old window, to be sure, boarded up, when first we came. A window I can't keep clean, do what I may, and half burns and nearly blinds me at my sewing, besides setting the flies and wasps astir, such flies and wasps as only lone mountain houses know. See, here is the curtain, this apron. I try to shut it out with, then. It fades it, you see. Sun gild this house? Not that ever Mariana saw. Because when this roof is gilded most, then you stay here within. The hottest, weariest hour of day, you mean? Sir, the sun gilds not this roof. It leaked so, brother newly shingled all one side. Did you not see it? The north side, where the sun strikes most on what the rain has wetted. The sun is a good sun, but this roof in first scorches and then rots. An old house. They went west and are long dead, they say, who built it. A mountain house. In winter no fox could den in it. That chimney place has been blocked up with snow, just like a hollow stump. Yours are strange fancies, Mariana. They but reflect the things. Then I should have said, These are strange things, rather than, Yours are strange fancies. As you will. And took up her sewing. Something in those quiet words, or in that quiet act, It made me mute again, While noting, through the fairy window, A broad shadow stealing on, As cast by some gigantic condor, Floating at brooding poise on outstretched wings. I marked how, by its deeper and inclusive dusk, it wiped away into itself all lesser shades of rock or fern. You watch the cloud, said Mariana. No, a shadow. A cloud's, no doubt, though that I cannot see. How did you know it? Your eyes are on your work. It dust my work. There, now the cloud is gone. Trey comes back. How? The dog, the shaggy dog. At noon he steals off of himself to change his shape, returns and lies down a while nigh the door. Don't you see him? His head is turned round at you, though when you came he looked before him. Your eyes rest but on your work. What do you speak of? By the window, crossing. You mean this shaggy shadow? The nigh one? And yes, now that I mark it, it is not unlike a large black Newfoundland dog. The invading shadow gone, the invaded one returns. But I do not see what casts it. For that you must go without. One of those grassy rocks, no doubt. You see his head? His face? The shadows? You speak as if you saw it and all the time your eyes are on your work. Trey looks at you, still without glancing up. This is his hour. I see him. Have you then so long sat at this mountain window, where but clouds and vapors pass, that to you shadows are as things, though you speak of them as of phantoms, that by familiar knowledge, working like a second sight, you can, without looking for them, tell just where they are? though as having mice-like feet they creep about and come and go, 
that to you these lifeless shadows are as living friends who though out of sight are not out of mind even in their faces is it so that way i never thought of it but the friendliest one that used to soothe my weariness so much coolly quivering on the ferns it was taken from me never to return as trey did just now the shadow of a birch the tree was struck by lightning and brother cut it up you saw the cross pile outdoors the buried root lies under it but not the shadow that is flown and never will come back nor ever anywhere stir again another cloud here stole along once more blotting out the dog and blackening all the mountain while the stillness was so still deafness might have forgot itself or else believed that noiseless shadow spoke birds mariana singing birds i hear none i hear nothing boys and bobolinks do they never come a burying up here birds i seldom hear boys never the berries mostly ripe and fall few but me the wiser but yellow birds showed me the way part way at least and then flew back i guess they play about the mountainside but don't make the top their home and no doubt you think that living so lonesome here knowing nothing hearing nothing little at least but sound of thunder and the fall of trees never reading seldom speaking yet ever wakeful this is what gives me my strange thoughts for so you call them this weariness and wakefulness together brother who stands and works in open air would i could rest like him but mine is mostly but dull woman's work sitting sitting restless sitting but do you not go walk at times these woods are wide and lonesome lonesome because so wide sometimes tis true of afternoons i go a little way but soon come back again better feel lone by hearth than rock the shadows hereabouts i know those in the woods are strangers but the night just like the day thinking thinking a wheel i cannot stop pure want of sleep it is that turns it i have heard that for this wakeful weariness to say one's prayers and then lay one's head upon a fresh hop pillow look through the fairy window she pointed down the steep to a small garden patch near by mere pot of rifled loam half rounded in by sheltering rocks where side by side some feet apart nipped and puny two hop vines climbed two poles and gaining their tip ends would have then joined over in an upward clasp but the baffled shoots groping a while in empty air trailed back whence they sprung you have tried the pillow then yes and prayer prayer and pillow is there no other cure or charm oh if i could but once get to yonder house and but look upon whoever the happy being is that lives there a foolish thought why do i think it is it that i live so lonesome and know nothing i too know nothing and therefore cannot answer but for your sake mariana well could wish that i were that happy one of the happy house you dream to see for then you would behold him now and as you say this weariness might leave you enough launching my yawl no more for fairyland i stick to the piazza it is my box royal and this amphitheatre my theatre of san carlo yes the scenery is magical the illusion so complete and madame meadowlark my prima donna plays her grand engagement here and drinking in her sunrise note which memnon like seems struck from the golden window how far from me the weary face behind it but every night when the curtain falls truth comes in with darkness no light shows from the mountain to and fro i walk the piazza deck haunted by mariana's face and many as real a story 
End of the Piazza by Herman Melville Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista